Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this evening, Lord. We thank you that we can come in your presence on the second week of Lent. Father, we may already start feeling the cravings. We may feel the pressure. And we may feel already tired and exhausted and we're not even halfway there. Father, I pray that through tonight's message we will realize that sometimes you ask us to do things that are difficult, to have a reward in the end that is fruitful. Father, I just pray that through this message tonight, we may leave home and be something that we can ponder on for the rest of the week, something that we will remember. I pray these things in your name. Amen. So Moses is up on a mountain one day, and all of a sudden a bush bursts into flame. And we know the story of the burning bush, and God speaking to Moses through a bush that does not burn. And the bush says, or God says through the bush, go and tell Pharaoh to let my people go. Now this was an interesting dilemma because Moses was the stepbrother of Pharaoh. Uh, If you had to break down the family dynamic, Moses was the orphan that was rescued in the basket and was raised up by the uh, Egyptian pharaohs and in the court. And... um, he leaves in dramatic fashion, landing up in an area called Midian, marries, has children, but then all of a sudden he is one day up in this mountain and this burning bush talks to him and says, go back, speak to Pharaoh, or in actual fact, his stepbrother or half-brother, and tell him to let your people, my people, the Hebrews, go. And before he goes and does what God tells him to do, he says, whom shall I tell Pharaoh sent me and God replies tell him I am sent you now that's a whole sermon on its own but uh, tonight we're going to look at this thing where Jesus refers to him or completes the I am and there are seven I am statements that Jesus refers to now a couple of years ago we actually did the I am statements for a camp called decamp and uh, we, we, pre- we made this on the back of our t-shirts And a very clever youth pastor at that stage when emojis, which are these funny little smiley faces and shop signs that you see on your your WhatsApp, was quite big at the time. So we decided to turn these uh, I am statements into emojis so that the, the youth could kind of remember them. So hopefully this will help you. There are seven I am statements. The first one is I am the bread of life. And you can kind of figure out which one of those emojis is the bread of life. And you find that in John 6. As bread sustains physical life, so Christ offers and sustains spiritual life. The second I am statement in John 8 is, I am the light of the world. To the world is lost in darkness, and Christ offers us a guide. The third, in different translation, is either the door or the gate. And we heard the version this tonight in the gospel, the door. He says, I am the door or the gate for the sheep. And we find this in John 10. Jesus protects his followers as a shepherd protects his flocks from predators. I am the resurrection and the life. And if you're confused about that one, that was the little cloud and the sun peeping behind it. I am the resurrection and the life as he, as he rose from the grave. We find that in John 11. Death is not the final word for those in Christ. Then I am the good shepherd. We find that in John 10. Jesus is committed to to caring and watching over his flock. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Find this in John 14. Jesus is the source of all truth and knowledge about God. And lastly, I am the true vine, which we spoke about uh, at the beginning of this year. I am the vine and the branches, which is interesting to do with what we are looking at in terms of the synod theme, um, new wine and new wineskins. We find that in John 15. By attaching ourselves to Christ, we enable His life to flow through us. And then we cannot help but bear fruit that will only honor the Father. Now, if you you observe it, you'll say, but John, there's not seven, there's eight. And that is the top one, the Alpha and the Omega. Now, this is a statement that has not yet been said, because we find it in Revelation 22, 13. So this is a statement that Jesus will eventually say if, if the revelation comes true and says, I am the Alpha and the Omega. And you actually see those two symbols 
on the cross of the altar, the Alpha and the Omega, as well as the, the crook, which symbolizes I am the Good Shepherd. I am the beginning and the end. So in this lesson tonight, where Jesus, in the gospel reading, Jesus refers to two pathways. He says there are two pathways in life, a wide and open pathway, and then there's this narrow pathway, but there are two gates at either, either end of these pathways. Now the wide and open pathway is quite nice because it's easy. It's easy to go down there, and you're going to have a lot of friends because there's a lot of people going down that path. And people who will agree with your actions, people who will egg you on to do the things that you should not be doing. But then there's this narrow path. And Jesus says that we should actually really try and go through the narrow path. We see this again in um, the story of, well, in the book of Matthew. This is at the um, Sermon on the Mount. Jesus reiterates this. Um, this idea. We can go to the next slide, Liam. He says, the narrow and wide gate, in Matthew 7, verse 13, enter through the narrow gate, for the wide gate is broad, and the road that leads to destruction, and many will go through it, but the small gate and narrow road leads to life, and only few will find it. Now, in Luke, as we just read this evening, he says, make every effort to enter through the narrow door or gate. Because I tell you, many will try and enter and they won't be able to. Three different gospels talk about this interaction that the kingdom of heaven, when we leave this earth one day, we are going to be standing in front of a gatekeeper. Now, the Catholic Church has this symbol of St. Peter or Paul standing in the gates, at the pearly gates. And they are the ones going to lead us. It's not quite that. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am, you go through, to get to the Father, you have to go through me. That's another one of the I am statements. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus is trying to explain to these people 2,000 years ago of how the kingdom of heaven will work. So a young man runs up to Jesus at the beginning of this gospel passage and says, are there going to be few people saved? And Jesus tries to explain it by this way. He says, there are two paths. An easy path, and then there's going to be a difficult path. But I suggest that you follow that difficult path. And this is what all but Lent's about. Lent's about trying to get us back on the straight and narrow, and that's where that saying comes from. Getting us back onto the straight and narrow path that leads to a gatekeeper, and that being Jesus. So I want to show you a little video but before you play it, Liam, just hold on a sec. This is a little illustration of what heaven could look like one day. And the two angels represented are, in a sense, deciding whether or not you can go into heaven. It's a little funny little cartoon, well, ca cartoon-like uh, video, but it has a very powerful message at the end. Thanks, Liam. <laughs> Bio, please. Mm -hmm. Some lying, some stealing, and some acts of kindness here and there. I tried to live a good life. Well, let's see how good. This way. Next. Bio, please. Okay, I admit it. I did a lot of bad things. Yes, I see. But I've done good things too, you know, to offset the bad things. Like one time I cheated on a test, but then I cleaned up trash in the park. Mm hmm. That should balance out, right? Let's find out. This way. That should have balanced out, right? It should have balanced out. Next. Bio, please. Impressive. Oh, yeah. I devoted my entire life to make this world a better place. I dug wells in Africa. I donated blood every month. And I ran an orphanage in India. I mean, I just wish I could have done more. Mm-hmm. 
And is this your subscription? I only read the article. I only read the articles. Next. My mom goes to church. Was baptized as a baby? Take American Express, right? Next. File, please. Whoa. Somebody's been busy. Well, let's get this over with. Sorry, um, I didn't know he was with you. Okay, step on the scale. Not you. Him. Hey, wait a minute. That is totally not fair. Yeah. That's why it's called Grace. Next. In John 14, 5 to 10, Thomas asked Jesus, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how will we know the way? And the I am statement that Jesus makes there, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father, in other words, heaven, except through me. A few weeks ago, about four weeks ago, actually, almost a month ago, I had a uh, flip chart here. And I gave the congregation a chance to put people on a scale or on, on this bar graph or this line graph Um, where they thought certain individuals should be. And we named people like Nelson Mandela, Snoop Dogg, Kim Kardashian. uh, I think we put Hitler on there. And then according to the audience, we decided where these people would go. And we also decided where the pass mark was, where heaven and hell was. So if you remember that, and I hope I'm making a bit more sense when I explain this, but we had this this thing here, and and the, the, the... the aim of the entire thing was to say, do not judge, because everyone had a different opinion of where certain individuals should go. And I kind of left a conundrum in the air. And I asked, the last thing I asked was, where do you think, because we kind of established that about, I think it was about 30 or 40%, we drew a line, we said, okay, if those, that's hell. So certain in- individuals below the red line are going to hell, and certain individuals above that, we put Mother, I think Mother Teresa was there, we had some nice people, not so nice people, and some people that there was a lot of discussion over, depending on how you interact or how you feel about that p- particular person. And um, I then left it with the, the idea of, and I, I kind of just, said, where do, would you put the pass mark for heaven? So it was 0 to 100, 30% was the pass, well, the failure, failure rate, and we had 100%, we had Mother Teresa up there somewhere in the 95 percentile, and I said, where do you find heaven? And what I did was I drew a line and I drew the infinity sign. I kind of left it there, and tonight I kind of want to use that analogy to kind of explain. We cannot get to heaven through our own deeds, actions. It's not, as you saw in this little video, and I hope it explains it a little bit better, it's not got to do with how good we were on this planet for the last 40 to 80 years or so. It's got to do with the fact that Jesus is the gatekeeper. Jesus, in a sense, is the one who has to stand on the scale of right and wrong. Jesus is the one who has to, in a sense, be the gatekeeper or the one who helps you through into heaven. And that is why he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And actually, all the I am statements, all seven of them, the, 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 the last one still to come, the eighth one, all seven of them remind, are trying to explain to those disciples and those earlier followers of Jesus that it is through him He is the bread of life. He is the good shepherd. He is the one that we need to follow in order for us to have an eternal life. And like I said a little bit earlier, as Lent 
is one of those practices in the church. Now, Lent is not a thing that we find in the Bible, except for the 40 days that Jesus fasted in the desert. It's not a, it's not a, 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 a biblical thing. It's more of a church thing. It's more of a traditional thing. That's why many churches don't do it. It's a traditional thing to get us back. Now, there was once upon a time, you may remember this, when Glow Mail and Very Mark were still very much part of our lives on TV. There was this strange device. It looked like a heart rate monitor. So nowadays, I think the younger generation don't know what I'm talking about because we've all got fancy watches that can measure our heartbeats and tell our blood pressure and all kinds of fancy things. But back then, there used to be a heart rate monitor that was connected to a watch and everything. But there was this device that looked like a dog shock collar. So you know those bark collars that have a little thing? So when the dog barks, it shocks him, it's actually illegal. It was a similar device that would wrap around your abdomen. Now, some of you might remember this, and the idea about this was that every time, well, they claimed that if you were able to clench your stomach muscles for long periods of time, you could get a six-pack. Now, whether that's true, I don't know, but this was the claim that Verimark or Glowmail, I'm not sure who was selling the product, was claiming that the more you clench your stomach muscles and you can keep them clenched the entire time, boys, maybe, I don't know, try it. If you can keep, to keep them clenched, you can, in a sense, do non necessary exercising sit-ups. So what this device did is it wrapped around your abdomen and every time it realized that you weren't clenching your stomach muscles, it would zap you like a little shock machine to remind you that you should clench. And every time you relax, it would shock you again. The way I describe Lent is kind of in a similar way. Every time those cravings come or those desires come for us to go against what we have decided to give up, take on, give away, let go of during Lent. When those cravings come, we should focus our eyes and our minds on Jesus. Because what Lent is, is taking us from that big, wide path of this world and drawing us back. It's almost like that when the cravings come, is that zap. It says, wake up, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Focus your attention on what truly matters in this world. I wish we had one of those little shock devices, but in a sense we do. It's a little still small voice in our minds that tells us that lovely illustration of Pinocchio has Jiminy Cricket on his, on his shoulder the whole time, his conscience telling him what to do. We have that. Jesus said when he, when he, before he leaves and he, he goes into heaven, he tells the disciples, I'm going to leave you a comforter and a guide, a paracletus. I'm going to leave you the Holy Spirit who's going to be inside you and who's going to constantly remind you, convict you, and comfort you. The Holy Spirit is our comforter and guide. Jesus even says that he is the way, the truth, and the life. He is our guide. He is the light of this world. He is the, our guide. And through the, para, the paracletus, the, the comforter guide, the Holy Spirit, that little still voice, our conscience, is constantly reminding us. We must just listen to it and not switch off the little device. We have a built-in device reminding us how to get back onto the narrow path. We must just listen to it more often. So Lent is about that. And again, I said last week, Lent, there's only two rules to Lent. One, it's your own journey. No one can tell you when Lent starts, well, we know when Lent starts with the Ashen Cross. If you never got the Ashen Cross on your head, just start Lent. It doesn't matter. If you need to change things up halfway, it's fine. If you need to add things because you feel like you're actually doing very well and you would like to do more, then that's fine. If you want to give up because this, this is too hard, then that's fine. Because Lent is not about a legalistic following the rules thing. It's a personal journey to get us back on the straight and narrow. And the second thing is Lent is not a New, New Year's resolution. One of my youth came to me the other night and said, John, I've already failed Lent. I said, no, you just, you just stopped trying. Because Lent is not a New Year's resolution where the moment that you failed, you give up. You keep on trying. You don't fail Lent, you just stop trying. So I urge you, when those cravings come, when the situation around us, when we want to run to that secret sin, when we want to run to those, those things in our lives that bring us comfort even for a second or a moment or a short period of time, that we remember that God is there. He is our bread of life. He sustains us. It's one of the reasons why the devil asked him, change these rocks into bread. Jesus says, you not, do not live on bread alone, but on every word of God. He is our bread of life. He sustains us. He is our right path. He is the light of the world. He is the gate who stands 
at the precipice where we, God needs to know or God wants to know who we are. And Jesus says, I know him. I know her. She is a child. He is a child of God. You may enter. Jesus is the I am. He came to complete and fulfill the statement that God made on top of that mountain when he said, who is sending, who do I tell Pharaoh has sent me? I am has sent you. As God said, let us pray. Father God, we thank you that you sent your son to show us the way, the truth and the life of this world, to be our light and our guide and our beacon, to sustain us through the times of trouble, to carry us where we need you the most, to be that good shepherd that looks after his flock. Father God, we thank you for the sacrifice that he made through his body and blood that we may evermore dwell in him and he in us. Father, I just pray for this church. I thank you for a vestry that went well today. Father, I pray for the finances, as that's always been a big problem in the last couple of years. I pray that your blessing and your abundant outpouring will come on this parish as we start to open up and as we start to start new ministries and new, a new way of doing things in the church. We pray for our Lent course that will kind of get our minds right and how we should rethink and redo church. We pray for the leadership of this parish who selflessly have to come and find out ways and they have a huge task ahead of them. Father, I pray for the staff of this parish who try their hardest to make things happen and work and just give the people of God a place of comfort and rest, even for a moment in this tough world. And I pray for the people in this congregation tonight that we may continue to seek the narrow path. For you are waiting at that gate, waiting to allow us in to a new way and to a new life. In your name, amen. Jesus died for me Yes, He died